questions. Okay. Hi, everyone. My name is Tara Moore, and I'm the Director of Conservation Partnerships for the North Carolina Wildlife Federation. Thank you all so much for joining today. We do have over 100 people on the call, so I appreciate everyone muting their lines. That is definitely appreciated so we don't get all of the background um, noise. I hope you all have been enjoying nature these past few months, being home a ton, um, and just really getting to embrace all the wildlife that you're seeing in your yards and on your walks in your neighborhoods. Um, today we have a very exciting presentation. I personally love turtles very much and Ann Summers and Jeff Paul are turtle whizzes. So we're definitely excited to have them on the call to do the presentation, Box Turtles Disappearing Gems of the Forest. This call will just be an hour. Um, somebody, somebody had seen that they, that this presentation was three hours um, on one place that it was advertised. So um, I just wanted to clarify, this is a one hour presentation. Um, if your line is not muted, please go ahead and mute it. But I think everyone looks really good. Um, and if anyone has questions during the presentation, please put them in the chat box. The chat box should probably be in the top right of your screen. Um, and it looks like a little blurb box. You can put your questions in there and either Jeff can answer them while we're going along or we can address the questions at the end of the presentation, but we will make sure to get to them because I'm sure we have a lot of great questions about box turtles. They're a really fascinating um, species. So at this point, I'm gonna turn it over to Ann Summers um, and she can get started. So you can go into present now mode and when you're ready. Okay, hi folks. I'm so glad to see we got such a great turnout. Uh, let's see here, window. And I need to get to my presentation view, my PowerPoint. All right, I see how we're doing this. Wait a minute. How are we looking there, folks? Do you see the title slide? Not, not yet. Just um, let's just give it one second. Um, Charlotte Speltz, it looks like your screen is actually presenting. If you just want to click the present now button in the bottom right hand corner to get off of the presentation mode. Actually, up in the middle, click Stop Presenting, the green. Thank you. That's also a good option. <laughs> yeah, you see how it says you're presenting to everyone? You can just click that green. Awesome. Thank you. Now you can try again, Ann. Okay, I'm on it. Let's see how we're doing. How are we looking? How's that? Do you see the title slide? No. I'm not seeing it yet. Okay. Can you um, let's try this? How are we doing now? Do you see yes. it? Okay. Yep. Perfect. Terrific. All right. Welcome, folks. Uh, today we're talking about box turtles disappearing gems of the forest. I'm Ann Barry Summers from UNCG and presenting with Jeff Hall. Say hi, Jeff. Hi, Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> Glad to be on with you today, Ann. Uh, this will be fun. We are going to start by giving a very special thanks to Sandy Barnett, who created the original version of this presentation and is responsible in, uh, for many of the images. So Sandy's been a good friend of box turtles and to me throughout the years. Um, do you see this Google Meet sign down there? Let me yeah, just it. click the hide and it'll go away. Okay, hold on. Well, it's gone enough. Uh, so uh, box turtles are the state reptile of North Carolina, and they're also the state reptile of 
a number of other states. Oh, okay, there we go. Oh, went too far. You can see from this map that the different colors represent different kinds of box turtles that are found throughout many of the states in the United States and into Mexico. So there's some um, a lot of variety when it comes to box turtles. Our particular version of box turtles we call the eastern box turtle. It's also known as the woodland box turtle. Box turtle's shell is more than a home. It's a bone. And box turtles are not able to crawl out of their shells. It's actually uh, fused ribs. The top shell is called the carapace, and the bottom shell is called the plastron. So we'll be calling them by both names throughout this presentation. Here you get a picture of the inside of the carapace. And you see the vertebrae are fused into the to the fused ribs. So a box turtle could no more easily crawl out of its shell than you could crawl out of your ribs or your backbone. There, uh, this is an average size. They get bigger, and some of them uh, achieve adulthood at a much smaller size than this. But box turtles are characterized by this dome-shaped shell. So when people call us and say, oh, I've got a turtle, I think it's a box turtle, then sometimes we say, is the shell shaped like a German army helmet? And if it is, we think that they've got a box turtle. Uh, Jeff, why don't you talk about these not box turtles? <laughs> Yes, so uh, another thing about the box turtle that we have in North Carolina is that it's the only turtle that actually can completely close itself inside its shell. Uh, routinely, we might get emails or calls from people that want to know about the type of turtle that they have in their yard and uh, or that they see out and about. And these are some of the common ones that we uh, receive photographs of or, or uh, text message of, things like this. So on the upper left, we have the common snapping turtle. Uh, upper right is the painted turtle. Bottom right is probably the one I get the most often confused with the box turtle, and that's the eastern mud turtle. Uh, and then on the lower left, those two photos, and in the lower central, uh, are the yellow-bellied slider. Uh, yellow-bellied sliders, snapping turtles, and painted turtles all reach a maximum size that's larger than the maximum size you would expect for a box turtle. The mud turtle on the lower right is in the, roughly the same size class. It might be a little bit smaller, roughly three to five inches versus the four to six inches that Ann showed with the box turtle. It also doesn't tend to have the reticulated pattern that you see on most box turtles or that, that uh, patchy um, blotched pattern that you'll see on box turtles. Eastern mud turtle has uh, more of a solid pattern. The other thing about them is that their shell is much flatter and not as domed as Anne was speaking about that uh, uh, military helmet look <laughs> of the box turtle. Uh, they also cannot completely close their shells as box turtles can if they choose to. So just a few pieces of, of, uh, of information about other turtles that aren't box turtles but maybe get confused with them occasionally. Great, thanks. And I just wanted to note to you, Jeff, I'm just getting a bit of feedback um, from your end. It's just kind of this um, scratchiness. So I just wanted to give you a heads up. Thank you. Okay. Sorry about that. I'll try to see if I can change something on my end. All good. Thank you, Jeff. All right. So we've got, this is what we, um, showing you a version of the box turtles that from different points of view, and you can see that it's important to look not only at the top of the shell, but, but underneath. Here, uh, I don't have it, um, I don't have it marked, but right here, there is a hinge on the bottom shell of the plastron that allows the turtle to completely close up within its shell. So, box turtles are absolutely unique in this regard, which makes them very fun. But if you've ever taken pictures of a turtle or a salamander, take pictures of both the top side and the bottom side. It's very helpful. Here we have uh, 
image showing you all the different, not all the different, every box turtle has a different pattern. But you can see on the left there, you've got one that's almost solid dark. And then you have some that are very brightly colored. If you look at these two pictures, you can see an image taken in 1998 and the photograph of the very same turtle in 2017. So look how similar that is. So the pattern, is, it, it wouldn't be absolutely identical, but identical enough that you could absolutely identify this turtle as being the same turtle. When we um, have our, our mark recapture studies, we put permanent marks on the turtles in addition to take pictures of them. But people with small uh, studies often can just take pictures. Uh -oh. We're getting really fuzzy now, Jeff. Or hello. Um. Yep. And I'm. Um. I think we're good. If you want to continue. Okay. Thanks. Box turtles are found in a lot of different habitats and. Our, our part of the world. As a matter of fact, box turtles occur in every county in North Carolina and fields, forests. They found around streams, but we consider them fully terrestrial turtles. When it's really dry, they certainly do like to get in a wet spot for a good soak and to rehydrate, but we think of them as fully terrestrial. What do they eat? Um, they eat a lot of different things. They don't mind eating dead stuff at all. Have you ever seen a box turtle eating dead stuff, Jeff? Is Jeff there? No, I think he has. <laughs> I'm sure he has. Uh, they also eat a variety of fruits, plants, mushrooms, invertebrates, they have a very wide diet and they don't have to go far generally to satisfy their dietary needs. And very often they'll spend the total, their entire lives in a very, very small space, small home range. In the spring, they will, not just in the spring, but box turtles will mate any time of the year. And the way they're able to, to uh, make that work is once the female has sperm, she is not obliged to lay eggs in any certain time period. That sperm can be stored for years uh, if it need be. So mating could take place any time of year. You might observe it, but the eggs are laid in the spring. So here, this shows you a picture of a box turtle who has dug her nest and she digs it just like sea turtles do as deep as their hind limbs will allow them. Depositing eggs and the picture on the right shows you a spot that a turtle might pick. The, the, um, they generally pick areas to lay eggs where it gets a certain amount of sun and that the, the eggs can incubate in those temperatures. There are lots of predators about. So I would suspect raccoon on this picture on the left. The birds will um, prey on the young ones. And here's a picture, I'm just gonna show you a little bit. This is a king snake that is actually predating eggs that are in the process of being laid. Get this. Nope, I want that away. Oh, I can't get rid of my laser pointer unless someone has a clue about how I can do that. Um, if you just want to click on the laser pointer again, Anne, that should get rid of it. Yeah, if you just want to scroll up to the laser pointer. Oh, I see the word. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, okay. Let's see if we can get a couple of seconds of this video.
Uh oh, we lost the feed. There we go. Okay. Um, so there are pl pl plenty of predators about, and once the um, if the eggs survive the incubation period, they will hatch. Notice that this turtle has uh, some uh, raised places right down the center of its spine that are a little bit lighter colored. And you can see how tiny this turtle is. Lots of predators on these. They stay very well hidden though. Birds will prey on them. I'm sure that uh, wild turkey prey on them. And um, so there's a lot out there. Even on through the adult stage, you can see that they have a number of predators. So these can be nest predators. A skunk will be a nest predator as well as predator of hatchlings. And coyote dogs are, are um, very serious hazards for turtles. Come fall, the turtles will hide, uh, or if they've had a good meal in the in the summertime, they will secure themselves in a place where they're hard to see. So anybody that's really looked for box turtles knows how hard it can be to find them. You can about be standing on top of them and miss them. If they move, that helps you to see them. Jeff, are you back on? Jeff? No? Okay. Yes, um, he is back on, and I think he's just answering some questions in the chat. Oh, okay. Yeah, can you can you hear me now, Ann? Yes, I can. So I was okay. just gonna see if you had anything to add. These show you some great uh, spots where turtles might be found. They like structure, so they like to have some cover, and so they're they're more likely to be in a brush pile or a near a stump than they are just out in the open. Anything to add, Jeff? Yeah, I totally agree with that. And one thing I've noticed uh, in looking for box turtles is especially after a little bit of a rain, uh, if you have a warm uh, day right following a rain or sunshine following a rain, you'll have turtles moving around a good bit more, probably looking for um, uh, uh, things to eat. And so that, that can be a, a good time to encounter turtles in the field is, you know, right after that rain that they might be moving about. Yeah, that's that's a good uh, suggestion. That's often when they'll get on roads also. So you may see them on roads on a June morning following rain. Um, so let's talk about sexing box turtles. Um, and as we go into this, I will say that some of the best herpetologists out there have stories about thinking that they knew a turtle was one sex and finding out later that it was a different <laughs> sex. So in our project called the Box Turtle Connection, we like to ask folks to look at um, five to eight different characteristics. And before they declare that they have one sex or the other, to have at least three of those characteristics. So decide for yourself, there's a male and a female here, decide for yourself which is which, and we will look at that. So one of the things that we find are typical of males, but not exclusive by any means, is that they have brightly colored shells, and that the females' shells will not be as brightly colored. Again, everybody that studies box turtles will have a story of a very brightly colored female and a very dull colored male. But that is, um, that is a suggestive. Uh, we also look at eye color or the color of their iris. So this female here has brownish colored eyes and this male has bright or red colored eyes. You can also see the color of the heads are very different. So the male has a brightly colored head that's blockier, slightly blockier than the female, which seems to have more rounded features. Now, if you look at this female on the left, you'll see here's a female that has red eyes. She has a dark colored shell and her head is pretty dark and her forelimbs are pretty dark. 
and the male on the right has pale red eyes. Sometimes we see males with yellow eyes. Any comment there, Jeff? Uh, no, just like you say, there is a lot of variation in the coloration of these animals, both their shells, their skin color, and their eyes. So you have to look at uh, a number of things before you decide what you got. Right, and one of those other things is the shape of the shell. So although they're all dome-shaped, the female needs to have uh, space within her body cavity to grow eggs, therefore that she needs volume in there. So often has a domed shell, such as the turtle on the right, and the turtle on the left is a male, which has a flatter shell on it. Here's a picture of them side by side, or two turtles side by side, a male on the left, female on the right, and the male clearly has a flattened sh uh, shape in comparison with the female. The plastron or the bottom shell also has differences according to what sex they are. The female will have a flat plastron and the male will have a curved or concave plastron. And that you can see the male in mating position on top of the female. And by having that concave place on his uh, plastron, it allows him to be stable as he's trying to mate with her, although it's a pretty unstable affair. I also want you to notice the back legs of that male. And the female will have the feet or the toes of the male clamped into her shell as she uh, as they mate. But that's why the difference uh, in the bottom of the shell. So here's a picture. Um, lots of variation in this characteristic as well. Hind claws. The hind claws of the male on the right here are thick and more curved than the female which is on the left. So when you uh, think of the picture we just saw, the male's hind legs or feet being clamped inside the shell of the female, that curvature allows that grip to hold so that mating can be completed until their sperm print transfer. So I always like to look at this um, characteristic. Tail length is another one. If you are able to pull the tail so that it comes out, you can see that the male will have the vent, have a longer tail, and the vent or the uh, opening on the tail is well be below both the, um, the top shell or the carapace, which is the one in the back. And the picture on the bottom is a female, and you can see the opening in the tail or the vent is between the top shell and the bottom shell there. So this, um, this can be quite striking a difference in some cases. And then I've seen turtles where that vent falls right there at the edge of the carapace and you're left wondering, what do I have here? So here's the same thing. Now, what do you think this turtle is? Tell yourself, is this, a, or ask yourself, is this a male or a female? Okay, and this is a, the, so it's a female on the left and a male on the right. And this is one of those cases where it's drastically different. Now, look at this turtle and ask yourself, is this a male or a female? Jeff Hall, what would you say? It looks like a female to me. It looks like a female to me too. Now, what, what do you say, what are you noticing on this turtle? The uh, skin color is not particularly bright. The eye color is not uh, as bright as it could be. The shell is a little more domed to me and the uh, rear uh, marginal scoots are not flared out quite as much as they are sometimes with males. And the hind claws are straight. 
Yeah, we yeah. didn't talk about that flaring out. We should mention that as other pictures come up for the carapace of the male. All right, what about this one, Jeff Hall? Yeah, that one I would say is a male. So you have bright skin patterns, uh, bright orangey there. The shell itself is, is uh, fairly bright. And you can see that uh, reddish uh, iris, although in this case it is a little bit more maybe almost pink, but it's, uh, it brights, it pops a little bit more than it would be if it were a female turtle. Uh, tough to see the, the domeness or not of the shell, but it does look like it might be a little less uh, high domed than than a female would be, but again, the, this side angle is not as as uh, critical. But I think the skin color and eye color is probably enough for this one. That's right. So if we, if we came across this turtle instantly, we would think male. Uh, the other thing to remember about eye color, to note about eye color, is that it can change in an individual depending on what their hormone level is. So this this male, if he had more, say, testosterone flowing in his blood at this time might have much brighter eye color than that. So the, an individual eye color does change and can change quite swiftly. Can you tell the age of a box turtle? We used to think we could tell the age of the box turtles by counting these rings that we call annuli. So we would go to we have workshops for our project leaders that are working on our turtle study and we would spend a lot of time trying to get them confident that they were counting these rings carefully but you can see in this picture that you may be confused about what you would count and what you wouldn't and a lot of research has been done on this and so now i feel very confident in saying no, you cannot tell the age of the box, a box turtle, an adult box turtle, unless you were there when it was born. So we've got turtles that were marked decades ago and recaptured that still appear to have the same number of annuli. So it's not a reliable indicator. However, if you have a very young turtle, and there are fewer than eight or nine annuli, or fewer than eight or nine of these rings. You can make a good guess, but I will also say you must acknowledge that it is a guess. There are a lot of things, these are, these are indicators of growth, and there are a lot of things that could interrupt growth in a turtle, such as disease, um, you know, a, a year where there wasn't much food available, et cetera. Lots of reasons. Anything to add, Jeff? I think you got it, Ann. Okay. Box turtles are not endangered. Uh, not endangered in our state or any other state. There are some that are in very critical condition in Mexico. So in North Carolina, we consider box turtles as a species of what we call greatest conservation need and say that they should be monitored to avoid continued population decline. This is what we are doing with our box turtle project called the Box Turtle Connection. All right, that's just a cool picture. What do you say that? I call that a male. All right, what are the threats to box turtles? Here is a picture of a developed area, and the green dots represent box turtle localities. So once an area is initially developed, box turtles, cert certain amount of box turtles would be killed during the heavy equipment phase on this, but a certain number of them would survive in nearby woodlands, uh, meadows, etc. But because the hazards are so critical nearby, for example, here we can see roads, the, the biggest threat to their existence. But anywhere you have houses, you also have dogs and other predators that may be supported on the food availability around those houses. So as the years go on, the turtles become fewer and fewer. So you would see fewer of them on the road. And that's not because they've learned not to cross the road, although maybe there is some learning there, but largely it's because 
they're disappearing from the landscape. Roads are, are certainly a big threat. Uh, and some people think box turtles can heal from any injury. They do heal remarkably from some injuries, but there are many injuries that they do not heal from. So this is one that had its shell pinned back together from a road crash and, and had its limbs um, uh, cast a cast there. And a turtle like that may stay in rehab for a year or two or more, depending on how well it heals. But it, it's hard for them to heal from such a severe injury in the wild, although it, it has happened. Lawn mowers are a big threat. I heard somebody mention that at the beginning of the program. Now, this is a, a real danger to box turtles. One thing you can do when you mow is set the mower at at least four inches high or higher, or set the bush hog at four inches high or higher. Although I've run bush hogs enough to know that there's a lot of up and downness that you cannot control with a bush hog. So um, mow as little as you possibly can get away with. So these are box turtle injuries, and these are gruesome enough from mowers, but there were plenty of pictures available of more gruesome injuries than this. Burning brush piles is a threat to box turtles. If a brush pile stays around for long enough, it will become a habitat for not just box turtles, but for lots of different kinds of wildlife. Burning that uh, means that you're going to burn up the animals as well in there, unless they somehow can escape. And snakes may, may be able to escape a little bit better. These are, uh, of course, we've mentioned dogs already, and we'll mention them again. But lots of dogs like to pick up box turtles. We actually use dogs to help us find box turtles, but these are highly trained dogs that have very soft mouths and are trained to not chew on the turtles or not to puncture the turtles with their teeth. And, and there are accidents that do happen, even with the most highly trained dogs we work with. So your neighborhood dog likely is not going to have that kind of training. Raccoons are smart. Not all of them know how to break into a box turtle shell, but some of them learn. And possums. Um, now, you could encounter a box turtle while you're outdoors enjoying wildlife. So you can see in the bottom left, there's a turtle here in the picture. So it's okay to pick them up. That's one of the coolest, most remarkable things and most endearing things about a box turtle is that you can pick them up without harm to you or without harm to them. And you can look them in the eye, look them deep into their soul, and really appreciate what they're all about. So you can pick them up, use two hands because they might try to walk in the air and scratch you, and you need to make sure that they're safe. But if you collect them as pets, then fewer young are born. And if they move from the wild into captivity, a lot of times they will adjust and do very well. But they are no longer contributing to the population numbers or the gene pool. And you would be contributing to their decline. Jeff, you want to add anything to that? I, I think you covered it perfectly, Ann. Okay. What can you do to help box turtles? Learn. Learn about them. We've got a great website we're going to be telling you about. And then share what you know with people you know. A lot of people know that if you find a, a turtle on the road that, and you want to help it, that you take it to the side it was headed. 
you can participate in programs. Um, we've got programs going uh, in different areas of the state, and here are a list of at least some places that have summer experiences for kids. The Greensboro Science Center, uh, Camp Chestnut Ridge, which is in Orange County, in Eflin, North Carolina, that's near Chapel Hill. All River State Park is going to be having a virtual camp this month, and they may have some activities in there with box turtles. They do have a box turtle project learning. So these aren't the only ones by any means, but learning more uh, about them. So we've already mentioned how to help a turtle across the road, but make sure that you're looking out for your own safety while you do that. Don't just jump out of a car. You've got to look and your life is, is important. Here. Some people pick turtles up in the road and they take them to a place that they think is better for them than the place where they found them. We discourage that because turtles know where they are. They know what's around them. They are at home. If you take them to a place where you think is better for them, they may spend the rest of their lives trying to return home. Leash your dog. So again, dogs are out there. Here's in the bottom left is a is a turtle shaped chewy squeak snack for dogs. I don't think I could buy that for my dog. I just don't because it, it I wouldn't want them to think it was a turtle. I don't know if they would or not. But um, leash your dog. Don't let them. Um, bother box turtles, and don't feed box turtle predators. This is a picture of a bird feeder, and uh, bird feeders often attract predators. This one has a good guard on the top of it, which helps a lot, so we approve that bird feeder. Do not feed your pets outdoors. That is an invitation to predators. It's supporting predators that um, are on the landscape. Make sure your garbage is well covered. This is a bad example of how to handle garbage. This is the right way to do it, so we approve that. So don't feed the predators. Don't participate in turtle races. We have had turtle races in North Carolina in the past. They certainly are popular in some states in the, in the South, and we discourage them. These are turtles taken from the wild. They very rarely get back to where they were taken from. So don't participate in those. Create a wildlife-friendly yard. Mow less, much less and take advantage of all this great information from the Wildlife Federation on how to plant native, how to provide habitat in your yards. You can plant. Hey, plant Ann. Yes. Uh, just a, a thought about the road. We've had a couple of questions here on that. So just to go back to it for just one moment, um, uh, I think your points about safety were really good and, and some folks were asking about, you know, moving them across and, and things like that and just had one, you know, when you move one across the road, you leave it at the edge or you move it further off the road? I think this, um, this boy in the picture here is showing a very good example of where to put them. Move them as safely as you can and I, I stand there and watch them and make sure they're headed in the right direction if I'm able to. Yeah, I agree. A little bit say? further distance yeah. off the road. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Sorry to interrupt you. Oh, no, please do. I want you to. Um, yes, people complain about box turtles in their yard eating their tomatoes, so please grow some extra for the box turtles. Blackberry thickets are wonderful places for box turtles to feed and they also meet each other there, the males and the females. Um, it's what I call the singles bar for turtles and it's where they can get hooked up with a date. 
in your yard, if you make a pond, make it turtle friendly so that turtles are able to get in and out safely. We know box turtles are terrestrial, but we also know that they will utilize uh, wet areas, certainly when it's dry. So they need to be safely able to crawl in and out. Join the Butterfly Highway Program. So anything you do to make your land and your yard better for butterflies, wildlife, certainly will make it better for turtles. Support mowing reduction programs. Mow less. If you can, build brush piles and leaf piles and leave them for wildlife. So we've got some handouts on how to build brush piles uh, on our website, which I'll be telling you about in a minute. The bottom one on the right has been uh, fabulous. So this is on my property and it's a fabulous place for wildlife of all sorts. So I've been enjoying that for years. If you burn leaves, don't delay after you make your pile. If you make the pile, go ahead and burn it that day. Don't give wildlife time to come to inhabit it. And report your sightings. Anytime you find a turtle or any other herp wildlife, you can report it to herpmapper.org or iNaturalist. Here is our website. It's boxturtle.uncg.edu. Lots of great educational materials, free downloads. There's, there's a whole book that you can download or you can download it by the chapters. We also have a Facebook page called Box Turtle Connection. This is our Box Turtle website. You can see there's educational materials here. So you would use that drop down menu to find things. One thing you might find is this box turtle card. So you can print these and give them out if you were doing a program for box turtles yourself. And there's also a download called Build It and They Will Come, Miracle Brush Piles, How to Welcome Wildlife into Your Yard. With that, I will end or give Jeff time to make uh, additional contribution at this time. Sure thing, Ann. I was just uh, uh, putting in some, some answers to some various chat questions, but I, I wrote a note. We had some questions about nesting, and so that might be a good one to, to spend just a minute about. Some folks were asking about incubation period. If they find a nest, what should they do? Things like that. Uh, I posted in the chat that generally most reptiles, including turtles, their incubation periods are somewhere in the 50 to 60 day range, although that is highly dependent on weather and uh, temperature. So if you get a lot of rain and it's cooler, it may be longer. If you have drier, uh, hot days, many of them in a row, then you may end up with a cooler period. Does that sound about right for you, Ann, in terms of- It does, uh, and, and turtle, turtle nests can, yeah, so it'd be typical, a typical year, 60 days or, or more, but, but turtle nests can hatch in as many as 90 days. Um, yeah. So, and, but there is a, you know, one of the things we're worried about is climate change and wondering how is that going to affect incubation periods. And the, there is a too fast. Um, so if it gets too warm, too fast, then it is lethal. So normally we would not expect eggs to hatch in any less than something like 49 days, something like that. Uh, another question, Ann, was about uh, folks using dogs for turtles. Um, it, someone pointed out maybe it would be best if you could have a dog that was uh, able to alert, bark and alert to field biologists rather than picking them up in their mouths. Uh, certainly part of that issue is a lot of times the dogs are not right where the biologists are. They run off to hither and yonder. <laughs> but uh, thoughts on that, Ann? Yeah, I think I think it would be great if one were to be able to train a turtle. I've got a friend trying to, to do it sort of a drop and stare technique for the dog. So the dog, once having found a turtle, would drop to lay in down position and stare at the turtle until you came along. I don't I have not personally had an experience with a dog like that. Uh, dogs yeah. are dangerous. They can be very helpful. Um, but 
they do need to be trained properly. And the professional trainers can help with this kind of thing. Most of us really aren't dog trainers. And so I would recommend being very careful about that. So drop and stare or sniff, or you might get a pointer that could actually point and that would hold yeah. a point. How about uh, uh, someone asks about the range of an individual box turtle? I know we've done some telemetry at a variety of sites, so maybe speak to that a little, Ann. All right, I've got uh, turtles that I have monitored that have never used more than four or five acres where I have found them on. Last week, I found a turtle that was 100 yards from where I found it five years ago. And five years ago, I found it 200 yards from where I found it. So if the habitat's good and the food supply is good, they may not go very far for at all, just a few acres, which means they can do okay in a neighborhood. Uh, I know Jerry Reynolds is on this call. Maybe we could get him to speak up, say something about neighborhoods. But also, one of your colleagues, Jeff, Jeff Humphreys, uh, tracked a box turtle that was using up to 60 acres in the sand yep. hills. Yeah. So, Jerry Reynolds, yeah, do you have anything to say? Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Yes. You, Jerry. Uh, just in my neighborhood, I started uh, officially documenting box turtles in my neighborhood, which I'm in Johnson County in 2008. And since that time, uh, up to the present, I've identified 36 different individual turtles. Uh, many I only see one time, uh, but there are a number of them that I, that I get recaptures for. And this is just by luck. I, I don't mark them. I use photography of both the carapace and plastron and I keep a uh, a photo sheet that allow me to compare the shell pattern above them. So yeah, that's a that's a great way to do it. Uh, with smartphones, you uh, go ahead and photograph the, the top of the shell, the bottom of the shell, get close in, uh, upload it to Hurt Mapper or iNaturalist. And that data, just think, you know, somebody 40 years from now may be able to compare a photograph of a turtle that you collect that you documented 40 years in the past that are still living to help document their longevity. So I definitely encourage you to, to document them. Yeah, and I'll, I'll speak on that just for a sec, Jerry. We've had some questions about various programs that people could use. And if you already have a program that you like, iNaturalist, HurtMap, or whatever, I, I encourage you to continue using it. If you haven't chosen one and you're looking for which one you should use, I recommend that you use HurtMapper just because it is easier for biologists like myself to glean data from Hurt Mapper than it is for iNaturalist. Uh, iNaturalist uh, obscures the data from, from folks that are connecting with it. And so you actually have to uh, work with each individual record holder uh, to, to make um, pure scientific use of some of that data. But if you're comfortable with it, keep using it. And, and like Jerry said, definitely record those sightings. I guess uh, maybe one last question. I know we're, we're short on time, Tara. If we got time for maybe one more. Yeah, I think I, I think I saw just another like three questions. We could probably just address these really, really quickly, Jeff. Um, one in particular that I saw was what are some ways to protect a nest if a turtle decides to nest in a backyard? And we had someone else uh, mention that they were using mesh wire. So any feedback on that would be great. So I think you could put mesh wire on, not just flat on top of the ground. You'd have to have space between the mesh and the ground, of course, all secured, fenced in, so that when the hatchlings come out, that, that you're able to protect them until they, I mean, they will be able to emerge. And then keep an eye on it and lift it up and let them go their way. Yeah, perfect. Thank you, Anne. Um, then I just saw, let's see, um, you talked about box turtles can mate any time throughout the year and that the female houses the sperm until she uses it in the spring. Where and how does she house the sperm? Is there a sperm storage organ? Well, I, I think that we're still working on 
figuring that out. Uh, so one could be an out pocket in the uh, cloaca or in the oviduct. But Jeff, do you know you know if that's been worked out yet or not? Or does anybody else on the call, Jerry? Do you know if that's? I don't happen to know that one specifically, Ann. I know in sea turtles that we don't see any storage area for the sperm, but and they also store sperm. So there's some mystery left in that that biology. Yeah, great. Um, thank you, Ann. And then we just had someone ask, is there more info on tagging to track the location? You're talking about radio tracking? Um, I'm not sure. I assume. Uh, if you want to clarify that, Julia. All right, we'll get back to that one in a second. I did see one other um, well, I have a comment on that. Yeah, go that ahead, I respond to. On the website I gave you, boxturtle.uncg.edu, there is a download. It's a whole book. You don't have to download the whole book. It's called Box Turtle Connection Building a Legacy. And there is a section in there on radio telemetry. But Great. you have to buy the devices that's close to $200 is the batteries that you glue on. And then you have to have a receiver device. And the ones we have are, you know, eight to $1,200. Okay, thank you. Yep, um, and I think that clarified her question. Perfect. Um, did anyone else have any more questions that didn't get answered? Thank you, Jeff, for keeping up with all these great questions. There's been a ton, ton of questions in here, and I'm not sure if you could see them, but um, I can't. But I'm so pleased. Yes, there's been a lot of great, great answers, and this vi this video is a recording, so it will be posted up on YouTube in the next um, about week, and it does record the chat also, so we will have that available. That has a lot of great questions and, and answers, so um, I'm excited to kind of do another read through of these questions and answers as well. So if anyone has any last minute questions, we just have another two minutes or so. Okay, looks like we have one more question. After babies hatch, should you hold them in a moist, safe place until the egg sac is absorbed? I'm going to let, I, my answer would be no, but I'm going to let what, see what Jeff Hall has to say about that. Yeah, I would agree. And I'm not sure what the situation is that the person is speaking of, but if you find a, a, a recently hatched baby turtle out in the wild, all you need to do is put it right back exactly where you found it, unless that was in the middle of a road or, uh, you know, in a, a pool or, you know, <laughs> something that seems like it's a particularly bad place for it. If you found it out in your yard, for instance, I would put it right back where you found it and let it go on about its way. Sometimes um, when hatchlings uh, emerge, they'll have a little bit left of that egg sac or yolk sac uh, that will eventually uh, be resorbed into the turtle. And there's nothing you need to do for it. it it'll do it all on its own without needing any help from a human. Okay, great. Yeah, it looks uh, like it's in a parking lot right behind their truck, he said. So I'd probably move it to the closest patch of grass or dirt because that obviously was not laid in the parking lot unless the parking lot's gravel, uh, which sometimes turtles will lay in parking lots, gravel parking lots. So I'd probably move it to the closest patch of grass and let it go there. Great. Move the turtle, but what about a nest in a, in a gravel parking lot? Oh. Uh, yeah, that's a different question. So if you find a nest that is in an area that's heavily traveled, like maybe it is right in the path of uh, tire tracks, um, or you need to park there or something like that, then you could potentially try to move the nest. Uh, that is a complicated thing and is not always resulting in positive uh, hatching success. But you can, if, if it's in a place that's going to be destroyed anyway, you can remove those eggs and put them in a similar location as best you can. Some important things about that if you do it is to make a mark on each one of those eggs as you remove them from the nest because you need to make sure they maintain the same orientation in the new nest that you build. The egg um, embryo actually attaches to the wall of the egg 
And if you turn that egg upside down, you actually can drown the embryo even within its own egg once it actually attaches with those chalazi to the sides of the egg. So you need to pay attention to that and move it into that same orientation and hopefully within the same sort of order that you find them in that nest. That's why I say it's not a trivial thing to move a nest, but if you're very careful and try to find a spot that's very, very similar, you might have some success. Thanks, so Jeff. marking it off and, and flagging it off and directing traffic around it, if that's possible. Uh, if it's in a truck parking lot, you know, they might take to having the nest there and feeling protective of it. And then again, people might feel put out. So you have to <laughs> judge that on your own. That's right. That's right. Perfect, guys. And we just have one final question. How do predators determine where eggs are laid? Is there a scent? Yeah, so I, I noted a little bit in the, in the chat box about that one. But yes, yeah, so when a turtle actually comes up to lay her eggs, uh, a lot of times they'll retain some water and they'll actually uh, use that water or urine, depending on whether they've got a little bit of both, to actually uh, moisten the ground to make it easier to dig in. And then they'll lay the eggs, of course, and then they cover all back over and they leave. So there probably is some scent there, depending on uh, how long the turtle took, how much rain there is that occurs between the time a predator is around and the, the nest was actually dug. So yes, there's certainly scent involved with that. And most predators are very keen uh, about scents in their environments, much more so than, of course, we are uh, and lots of other animals. So. Uh, I'm sure that uh, scent plays a massive role in uh, finding those sites. However, somebody mentioned crows. Crows are also visual uh, predators, and they will have actually been seen to watch turtles as they're nesting and then go to that site because they visually watched the turtle lay its eggs, and so they were able to go in and home in on that site specifically. Um, so they're a pretty amazing predator to be able to do that. But I think scent is usually the primary uh, uh, piece. There is another um, piece to this, and that has to do when the eggs are hatching. So there will be movement in the nest that will alert predators, you know, in the, in the last day or two before the turtles emerge from the nest. And I, raccoons can key, uh, key in on that. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Anne. Thank you so much, Jeff, um, for all of your words of um, wisdom about box turtles. Um, hope everyone gets to see a box turtle in the wild at some point and that we all enjoy our day. If we have any further questions, please feel free to email them over to me. I put my email in the chat, but tara at ncwf.org, and I'll make sure to get them over to the two experts on our call. Um, so thank you so much, and I hope you all have a great day. Yeah, thanks for coming. Bye, everyone. Yep, thanks for having everybody here, and sorry about my audio issues at the beginning. <laughs> no problem at all, Jeff. Thank you for being here. You can probably stop recording, Tara. Is the thought. I was just thinking that. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, guys.